Hello, hello. Wisdom Wednesday, October 18th. Steve Cypress here. Uh, should have taken a sip of water. Before I started the recording, who's in charge of this thing anyway? What a complete amateur. Okay, Rhino of the Day is one of my many. I've been on a kick of like small rhinos lately. Uh, open a box that has tons of them in it, and here is just a little plastic yellow hollow. You can see it's hollow. It's even got a hole in the front there. <laughs> it's a hollow little yellow plastic rhino. Okay, so today's Wisdom Wednesday is a quote from Richard Branson who says, what did I write here? Clients do not come first. Uh, employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of the clients. So let me repeat that. Clients do not come first. Employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of the clients. So it's a, not the, it, it's a contrarian quote because it, it opens the mind of the entrepreneur who might be thinking, according to Richard Branson, and I'm going to share uh, some examples of why I agree, that it's not for the uh, business owner to him or herself personally care and do good for the clients. The, if, unless you're a solopreneur, of course, and then you, for some reason, insist on staying small and never leveraging your ownership of a business into what it really could be, a life-changing producer of revenue and time and become stress-free and put systems in place and grow and all that kind of stuff. If you're a solopreneur, then of course you do everything yourself. Then you, in your role as an employee, you need to take care of yourself as your employee and then as the employee take care of the clients. But I'm speaking to all what I call the real business owners that have a real business. You have employees, so let's take a heating and air guy. Uh, it's up to you to take care of your installers so that they go out in the field and take care of the clients. That's what it's all about. And if you're getting complaints from clients with the experience that they're having, it comes back on you, and it's likely because you weren't taking good enough care of the employees. And here's the thing, another contrarian thing, and something that often we don't think about, but we're not talking about simply taking care of them in terms of money. And so I'll give an example that speaks extremely loudly to that. It's an example that's been in the news for a while, and I've been talking about it in my videos for weeks now because I was a lifelong fan of the NFL and specifically my formerly beloved New York Jets football team, which now I don't care about anymore. I've moved on to other hobbies and interests, and no more time or money or effort or thought is going into giving a crap about the Jets or the NFL or what they do other than – in a case like here, I'm, I'm interested from a purely outside business perspective to see how they handle things, But which mainly means I'm doing a lot of laughing these days at how pathetic they're handling this current situation in PR nightmare, and they're losing lifelong clients, customers like me. So you might think that the it's up to the NFL, a lot of people think it's up to the NFL to take care of me and to make a rule that their employees have to do such and such. Hey, let's force, people are calling for, let's force, let's have the NFL, I'm disappointed the NFL doesn't force the players to stand and respect the national anthem, and, and therefore then the fans will be happy. No, they won't. I, as an ex-fan, would not be happy. I've said it many times on these videos, like I'm not interested in being a customer of a business or a fan of a team, which is the same thing, uh, or anything like that, if the employers are being forced to respect me. Like, I'm not interested in that. If I walk into a fast food restaurant, I understand that the rules are to, for them to smile and say, may, may, can I help you, and would you like a number two, or would you like fries with that, or whatever. I understand they're following rules, but I don't want any thought of there's some manager looking over their neck or, or, or videotaping every customer interaction and somehow forcing someone who otherwise doesn't really isn't really happy with things going on with their employer isn't happy to be there hates their job they're miserable then I would see a forced smile which we all know what that is and, and we would say you know why is this person working here you're so utterly miserable what are you miserable about is it is it that you're serving a bald guy 
you know, with, who doesn't shave and wears ridiculous red Hawaiian shirts every day. Is that what you're upset about? And they say, of course not. I'm upset about such and such that my boss is not properly respecting me and addressing me about, and therefore I'm passing it on to you, and now you're a disgruntled client. And that's what's happening in the NFL. So it's not up to the NFL to take care of the clients. This whole issue, the fans in this case, the, the customers that watch on TV, that buy the sponsors' products, that go to the games and buy the NFL direct uh, season ticket. Uh, I don't know what I called it. I canceled it. But uh, I was paying 300 a year just to watch my formerly beloved New York Jets play one football game a week for a few months a year. I was paying hundreds of dollars for that. That's that's what a rabid fan I was. I, I started from scratch when I was back in my last year of law school what became the largest fantasy sports game company in the history of the world. Uh, clearly, I invested a lot of time and money and energy into following and loving professional sports, and in this case, specifically the NFL. But this issue is not about the NFL taking care of the clients. It's an issue of the NFL not care, taking care of the players. And so now the NFL is starting to realize that. And you see on the news, oh, they're having a meeting. They keep meeting with the players. We're meeting with the players, and we we got to figure something out of how to address these issues. And then they don't say, so that they stop disrespecting the fans and the flag and the national anthem and doing their protests, and they, they stopped doing those. But the NFL is understanding what Richard Branson is saying here. It's not for the NFL to make a rule. They didn't say, and, and everyone's questioning them and coming out and going, I don't understand. Let's well, just make a rule. You make a rule about everything else. They have to show up at a certain time. They have to wear a certain uniform. They have to wear a certain helmet. They can't wear different colored shirts and helmets and uniforms, and when they – as far as the team owners, they insist you show up at a certain time for practice and you have to show up at a certain weight and you have to show up and be able to rep, you know, do a number of reps on the bench press and you have to be in enough physical shape and pass the physical. And then you have to study the playbook and show that you know when the quarterback says 42 skidoo that you go to the left and go 10 yards over here. I mean, there's a lot of rules going on here. And you got to dress a certain way when you go on road trips. Why do you think they're all wearing three $5,000 custom suits? Like, you think, wouldn't they, I'm, I assure you, they'd rather wear ridiculous things like me wearing ridiculous, silly red Hawaiian shirts. But there's a dress code. There's a lot of facial hair codes on some teams and all kinds of off-the-field rules and, and what you can and can't do and what you can and can't promote. You can't promote anything to do with gambling. can't promote anything to do with anything illegal, uh, on and on. So there's all kinds of rules of conduct, rules of behavior. But in this case, the NFL is finally, I think, realizing, and, and, and maybe the fans, or at least the few fans that are watching this video, a few, I get a few, several hundred views per video. And there's a few people here live. There's always Kathy's here, Ben is here, and Rich is here. Great to see you guys. Rich, are you in Chicago? You told me last week you were heading up to Chicago this week to watch the Cubbies against the Dodgers. And... Uh, I'm rooting for you to get to watch all three games. So hopefully the Cubbies perform some kind of miracle and win a game tonight. And uh, Rich, who's a business owner, very successful business owner ever since I first met him 30-something years ago, uh, says business for the benefit of owners first, customers second, employees last, won't last long. Exactly. All, oh, however, uh, I, 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 you, you've got the point exactly, but – Unfortunately, I have to disagree a little bit with the last long part. They can last forever. They just, you know, have trouble. Like the NFL, it certainly lasted long. It's been around, what, 100 years or so. Like, it's lasted long. But it's got all kinds of problems brought to light by this whole disrespecting the national anthem just to get your attention here. So here's, here's an issue. And I see another comment. Ah, Rich. Not in Chicago. After the loss last night, I canceled flying today. Well, unless you're a Dodgers fan, then you would certainly go. But, man, when you said you're going to Chicago for the games next week, I assumed you're going for last night's game. Like, might not even be a tomorrow night's game. And tonight, that place is going to be like a funeral parlor. Like, it's just going to be – I mean, the fan, towards the end of the game last night, as they're panning around the crowds, leaving early, and the, everyone's miserable, and, you know, 99% of the audience not even wearing rally caps. Like, yeah, not a great place to be. Wrigley Field, to begin with, is a decrepit, horrible place to watch a game, play a game, report on a game. I mean, you saw it last night. Like, uh, they asked uh, uh, Chris Taylor, like, when you hit a – ground ball down the line in left field. Nobody goes for third base and gets a triple on that. Why'd you do that? He goes, 
because there's ivy out there. And and he didn't have to mention this Kyle Schwarber, who, even though he has a cannon for an arm, is a klutz playing a field. But he's like, there's ivy out there, and you never know what's going to happen. Is it going to ricochet this? That's stupid. I mean, this is a stupid stadium where you got ivy and brick walls. You had another play last night. Oh, the ball gets lost in the ivy. Now, that was good for the Cubbies uh, because they had a base running gap. Anyway. Let's get back onto the topic here. So uh, sorry to hear that, Rich, because playoff baseball is an exciting thing. Um, okay, so spoken from experience, been to many playoff football, baseball, basketball, hockey games, you name it, all of them. Was a big fan of all those. And very quickly, rapidly, I've already – I'm out of the NFL. Likely, if I pay any attention, the NBA is probably doing the same thing, and I'm out of there. Baseball still maintains their respecting their fans and themselves and their country – and hopefully they take a cue from what's going on in the NFL, or they watch this video, or they just read the quote from Richard Branson, take it to heart, and fix their problems. Because here's the deal. And and here's the secondary issue I wanted to point out, that when we say, and Richard Branson says, take care of your employees first, and they'll take care of your clients, it's not just money. That's a big mistake big business owners make, especially sales managers. When they pay out bonuses to salespeople and they say, if you make X number of sales, you get a $50 bonus, $20 bonus. Yeah. You know what? Sales people, and I speak from experience, been a salesperson my whole life, and my father was a salesperson pretty much his whole adult life. Uh, salespeople are not simply, near, nor is anybody, simply motivated just by cash. I know it sounds strange because salespeople work on commission, but if you give a $25 bonus, for a certain number or amount of sales or percentage or whatever as a, as a bonus to salespeople, I'm going to let you know, and surveys will show, and my experience and thousands of other salespeople I've talked to, hired, trained, managed, coached over the years, instead of that $25 cash, if you gave them something worth $20, but it's something they loved, uh, they would much more appreciate that. So not only do you save money, you can, if you want, save money by not giving out cash or thinking you're treating your employees right just by giving them cash, but by giving them items. All the time, in fact, you see celebrities go on a talk show, for instance, and I know they're, you know, they're celebrities, they're actors, they're entertainers, but they, they're generally, and I can tell you from giving corporate gifts and receiving corporate gifts. So let's just use me. I was going to use celebrities who get swag bags and they go like, man, I want a t-shirt like that. Like you could spend 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever it is now to get a t-shirt. They make millions of dollars, but they would want that t-shirt. So they wouldn't say, oh, I, w I was in the green room before I came out. You gave me 20 bucks. How's it, what's that going to do for a multimillionaire entertainer, right? But if you said, hey, here's a shirt that says whatever, they're like, hey, thank you very much, blah, blah, blah. It's 20 bucks. Like the 20 bucks wouldn't matter, okay? And to me, people give me gifts all the time. They send me stuff. I shoot videos showing the gifts they give me. And they send me a gift sometimes, it costs five bucks. But I'm like, hey, I really appreciate that. Somebody sent me something in the mail, physical, didn't just email, a text message, or any of that BS that isn't big mistake business owners make. Save that for another day. Send something physical in the mail, and even if it's five or ten bucks, I appreciate it. Could Now, could I buy? And I'm like, wow, that's a cool whatever. Could I go buy a hundred of them right now if I want a course? But I didn't, and I won't, but I like receiving one as a gift a lot, and I remember that person in that. So here's an issue. Here, here's an example. The NFL, you might be tempted to think, but what do you mean the NFL doesn't take care of their players? These guys make an average of $2 million a year. They're certainly taken care of, and then they fly on private jets, and they stay in the best hotels, and they eat the best food. I mean, those clubhouses are just full of spreads of the best food, and, and when they win – they spray around like thousands of dollars of champagne, and they just spray it all over the place. They don't even drink it. Like the team provides that. The team provides fantastic, other than the Cubbies, fantastic playing environment and and uh, dressing rooms and uh, clubhouse environments, first class stuff. They provide them the very best trainers and physical support, the very best weight rooms. They provide them. Uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, Oh, the rings. If they absolutely we ever see these, if they win a championship, the team gives them these rings that are unbelievable. These rings have like 4,000 diamonds in them and emeralds and ruin, whatever, and this and then, their name on it. Now, the player makes millions of dollars. Couldn't he go out and spend 100 grand and get a ring? Of course. You can get 10 of them every year, and they still make an mil extra million a year on the average. But, but, of course, they don't do that. They really appreciate, though, that the team gives them 
this ring, and I don't know what the ring costs, 50 grand, 100 grand, 200, whatever the cost, it's not the money, okay? So the NFL is seeing that. So if the NFL thinks, I don't understand why these players are disgruntled and doing all this and ruining our brand and causing people like Steve Cypress to never again be a fan of us, and we lost a customer for life, who was a spectacularly great customer, and we lost them over this, and it's no, it's thanks to the players. Wrong. It is thanks to you, NFL, the team, the executives of the NFL, the team owners, who who the players are, employees. It's an owner-employee relationship. Now, I happen to, uh, I could find, in fact, tomorrow's throwback Thursday, I'm going to find this. I did my senior honors thesis way back in college in 1978. That'll date me. It's almost... 40 years, my 40th college high school reunion will be coming up next year. You're kidding me. Yeah, that's right. That's craziness. Holy moly. No wonder I got gray hairs. So, uh, but I did my, oh, it was my college. I did my college senior honors thesis. So that would be 1982. So that's not 40 years ago. It's 35 years ago. Oh, my 35th college reunion is coming back this year. So, I went to way too much school, by the way. Another lesson for another day, but I got high school, college, law school, so it's almost always a fifth or a tenth or a something re uh, reunion every year. But anyway, so I will find my – I know I have it somewhere. I will find my senior honors thesis, and I did it on baseball's reserve clause. My major was – I was a liberal arts school. So, again, another lesson for another day. Uh, but my major was American studies, and my minor was legal studies. And I went on to law school. I wanted to be a sports agent or something. So uh, there was my paper. It was about something legal to do with America. And, of course, since sports is like pretty much was my entire life for most of my life, um, that's what I did it on, baseball's reserve clause. And uh, it was 164 pages, I think. I'll find it. I'll share it tomorrow on Throwback Thursday. And it was uh, it, it, I, 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 as in the research for it over you know a year's worth of working on this thing. I came across all kinds of stories, many of which you've heard, or you can go on Google.com, I'm sure, and type stuff in and find them. But the amazing abuse, the historical, amazing level of abuse by the employee, of the employees by the owners of professional sports team. Now, my thesis was on baseball in particular, but don't think I didn't read all kinds of stories while I'm researching things or just by being a sports fan. You hear stories of NFL, NBA, NHL, mostly most it was all it was pretty much baseball I was researching, but I mean the famous stories of the players coming in and saying I want to renegotiate my contract, and and the owner saying you know I'll give you an extra five bucks. Meanwhile, the owner's a millionaire, like and you know uh, see you. No, I won't upgrade the team bus, and no, you don't get new uniforms. I know you got itchy, scratchy, you know wool uniforms back in the day. Like now, I'm not spending money on that. Meanwhile, the guy's a millionaire. He's like smoking hundred dollar bills instead of cigars. Like what abuse? So that's what my thesis is all about. This reserve clause. What it was the dawn of what's the breaking of the reserve clause, the dawn of free agency, which is like you or me or anybody else on earth. We're free to work for anyone we want. But the the pro athletes for years were treated as now. I think it's another mistake for the players to claim this is like the plantation. That's going way too far because they do get paid millions of dollars a year and they're celebrities and, and, and they have pretty much no other skills other than go pump gas or bag groceries or something, which Kurt Warner was famously bagging groceries when he was signed and became a Hall of Fame quarterback. I mean, that's pretty much, they don't have any skill or talent. They didn't go to class in school. They were going to school to be a pro athlete anyway. So, uh, it's not a plantation at all, but there are, the aspects of it ring true. And this is one of the access, the, the, the control abuse, I will say, the control abuse, the fact that, like, the owners, which we all know, and we, if we own businesses, we know, of course, we're in control of our employees. But if we're going to be successful and we're paying attention to Richard Branson's quote, he's rather successful, like, we don't do that. We don't lord it over. We don't do stupid things. We don't say, like, I mean, we don't say... I insist you show up every day. If you're one second late, I dock you $100 pay. If I ever find you making one personal phone call, I uh, post your image all over social media with a big L on it and call you a loser. I mean, I, you know, what? I mean, we don't do that kind of stuff. We don't abuse. Uh, we make reasonable rules and we treat our 
hopefully we treat our employees fairly and hopefully that's why unions shouldn't be necessary if employers just treated their players, their employees fairly. In this case, unions cropped up for the players because of all this unfair treatment. And one of the things this reserve clause meant in every contract that every player signed was what was known as a reserve clause. It meant, and I don't know it verbatim, it's in my paper, of course, but it, it said something like, and still to this day, it says something like, but back then it was perpetual. And it said something like the club, at the end of the contract, the club reserves the right to sign the player for the next year if they so choose. No choice of the player, the choice of the employer. We own you, in other words. So, yeah, again, they don't really own the player because the player can retire. And to my knowledge, and I did study back in those American studies days, I did study slavery, and I wrote a, a big, long paper called The Rigors of Slavery and All the Slave Ships and was outrageously unbelievable inhuman treatment, of course. And uh, But you couldn't retire and say, I'm out of here. Uh, players can. So clearly, again, you're going a little too far to call it a plantation, but those elements are there. Players could, cannot, could not, back in those days, say, I want to go play for another team. I'll bet they'll pay me more money. You were reserved to the first team you signed a contract for forever for as long as you want to play. Now the rules in baseball, I think it's seven years on your first when you're a rookie, and then every five years after that, you can, that's it. That's all they can reserve you for, and then you can become a, what's known as a free agent. You can sign anywhere you want, make all the money, and that's when the salaries and the pay exploded to where now players make millions of dollars a year. Um, so in the NFL, uh, I'm sure, you know, I know they have similar whatever. I'm getting a little off topic here in my brain. So at this point, let's go to see some comments, concerns, questions. Uh, Rich says, uh, hey, Ben is here. Thanks for being here. Rich says, fan-friendly stadium outside and inside the park. Absolutely. Well, not uh, not actually. Not if you've been there. Um, it seems fan-friendly, like, because it's known as the, their brilliant marketing. They call it the friendly confines. But it is a dreadful, miserable place to watch a game. Now, outside is fun because it happens to be in a stadium surrounded by in a, in a city, I mean, surrounded by it's, a lot of stadiums are surrounded by just parking lots in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Wrigley Field, since it's over 100 years old, is still right there in a city, and it's surrounded by, therefore, all kinds of bars and restaurants and fun places to go before and after and during the game. Lots of fans just show up and go to those bars across the street from the game. And so, yeah, it's a fun environment. Uh, but once you get inside that stadium, that is a – the seats, I mean, if you're if you don't have – if you have seats like out left field, they're not facing like the pitcher's mound. They're facing straight ahead. So you're facing like behind the center fielder even. I mean, you, of course, have to sit now sideways in your metal seat so that after the three or four or five hours nowadays of these games, of course, and it doesn't even take that long, your back is absolutely killing you. Um, there's The concrete is famous for just falling on people's heads from above. I mean, they've made some improvements to the stadium. You, you go to the bathroom, you're peeing in a trough. Like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, to, to use a pun on the current ownership being named the Ricketts family, it's a rickety old crappy place to watch a game. It's a, an absolute crappy place to be a player. And, uh, you saw that yesterday, the players, you know, of course, do not want to run full speed to catch that ball in the outfield because you're running into a brick wall or you're running into a wall of Ivy. Like, so you know, uh, 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 what do they call Visiting players come in and play, you know, six games a year there, and they can put up with, hey, for six games a year, I don't go all out in the outfield because then you'd be stupid because there's ivy and brick walls in Chicago. But Chicago players, it's half the year, 81 games. I don't go all out in the outfield because otherwise I'm risking my life. That's just that's just stupid. And so it's a it's a dumb uh, thing, and, it's, and, and you can ask anyone that covers the games. The press uh, environment is terrible. The terrible conditions. I mean, it's the only, unless I, I'm missing something, it's the only bullpen in all of baseball that the fans don't even get to see it. It has to be underneath the stands out in the hallway. Like, how ridiculous is that? I mean, one of the most fun things, they showed it last night, the Cubs guy, uh, Schwarber, it's a home in the first thing. Bullpen is dancing and having a party and laughing. That was like my favorite part of the game. But if you're there at the stadium, you don't get to see it. Like, anyway, I digress. Uh, and Rich says, uh, you were at the World Series there last year and the uh, NLCS. Right, so you know, and then true on the seats. Yeah, it's not just the seats and the peen and the trough and the old decrepit place. I mean, it's a 100-year-old piece of crap place you're in. Yeah, they put a lot of money into it, but it's a piece of crap place. And you can roam everywhere to meet celebrities. New stadiums are banned from rich seats. 
well, then that has changed since I've been there for sure. Because uh, every time I went to Wrigley, and I lived in Chicago 15 years until two years ago, these ushers are sitting down in front of the good seats in these foldable little tiny little foldable, like you go watch a golf tournament, the little foldable seat, and you absolutely can't get by them. It doesn't matter if nobody's there, and it's the 18th inning on a snowy, cold day, and nobody's they, they don't let you by. You cannot get down there. So I guess something has changed. Anyway, Kay Kirkman is here. Long time. Hope you're doing fantastic. So wherever I was, here's the point. Don't think that taking care of your employees is solely money. You're seeing that in the NFL. Oh, but these guys get millions of dollars. So they ought to blah blah. No, it. This is the, the issue of the players disrespecting their own fans. Right? You go to a game. There's going to be fifty thousand people standing at attention when the national anthem is on. We put our hands over our hearts and some sing along with it, and you face the flag. I mean, and yet down on the field, the actual players, the employees, the entertainers uh, of this show are not doing it. So they're going, yeah. We don't do that crap. You idiots in the stands are doing that because you're idiots and you don't get it or you're whatever. We don't have to do that. We can do what we want. I mean, it's so disrespectful to the fans, the flag, the national anthem, but why are they doing this? There's something going on with their employer. It's a team owner's fault. So here's now here Donald Trump's solution was, again, off base, if you ask me, totally wrong. The authoritarian uh, way, which I don't agree with. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of things Donald Trump does. I don't know who does. But uh, anyway, so uh, Donald Trump says, oh, they could have solved this problem easy when it was just that one hypocrite guy, Colin Kaepernick, who, of course, started out by just pouting on the bench because he lost the starting job and then said, you know, someone got a hold of him. I think the story was his girlfriend got a hold of him and said, you know, you look like the two-year-old losing crybaby that you are. You can turn that into looking noble. If you just make up a cause, and here's a good cause, police brutality against minorities. Like, that's a good one. Racial injustice, that's a good one. So, you know, that's how it, that's how it became disrespecting the flag for that cause. But uh, make no mistake, of course he was disrespecting the flag, and of course they still are, and they know what they're doing, and it's working. They're getting attention. They're getting all these meetings. They're getting their employees to maybe make a change and take care of them because Donald Trump comes out and goes, here's how you solve it. Back when it was just Kaepernick. You say, if you do that again, you're benched for one game. You do it again, you're benched for two games. Do it a third time, you're benched for the season. Like, yeah, that's the authoritarian way. That's not the quote from Richard Branson. He didn't say if you order around in an inhuman way and disregard the, 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 the wants and the desires and the needs of your employees, then everything will be great. Like Richard Branson from this quote would say, here's how you do it. You immediately... Colin, Colin, not immediately, because the first time all he was doing was pouting that he lost his starting job. He wasn't protesting anything. However, that is, you immediately call him into the office and you say, hey, Colin, okay, I understand. You're upset about X, Y, and Z. So the first week he was just upset about getting benched. But you can't sit on the bench during the national anthem and disrespect everything and everyone in the stands, everyone watching on TV, the flag, the national anthem, the country, the league, the ownership. You just, you can't do that. So what do we got to do to make this right? And they could have worked something out to make it right. Okay, but I'll tell you what, you're not good anymore. You used to be good. Now you're not good enough to start. And no, you're, of course, not good enough to be signed by a team as a backup because have you looked around who the backups are? Backups are rookies, for the most part, who are being groomed to later on be the starter. They're not guys at the end of their career whose skills are deteriorating unless you're going to play for a contender who says, okay, I will sacrifice the spot normally for grooming future quarterbacks because we want to win now. So I will sign this aging, deteriorating veteran because at least he can plug a hole in there for a few weeks till our starter comes back or till we trade for somebody good or something like. But, you know, you see a team like the Patriots that would never even think of signing anyone so selfish that he's drawing attention to himself. You know, you come to the Patriots, they're like, there's a reason we win, and we do not get any distractions on this team. So don't even think about it. You're out of here. Like, that's yeah. – anyway. But um, so you, you pull him aside and you go, okay, I understand you're upset about getting benched. We can't fix that because you suck. However, what do we got to do? Because you can't sit down. So maybe should we just let you go and we won't even keep you as a backup because we'll do that. We'll trade you somewhere else because obviously you're unhappy here. But let's work something out. But no way the next week will you be sitting again on the bench. 
and then turning it into this whole thing. But then they could have done it after two, three weeks. Were done. They could have brought him in and said, okay, now you're turned it into you're protesting against whatever. How can we address that? Can we set up a fund? Can we help you to uh, do uh, organize marches? Can we uh, have a week where we say it's uh, uh, Racial Inequality Awareness Day and we'll do something with all of our massive publicity that we can generate in a whatever like we do for breast cancer awareness, everyone wears pink, maybe now everyone will do. Can we do something? Because we can't have you wearing socks out on the field with pigs, cops, you know, pigs in cops' uniforms. We can't have you wearing a Che Guevara T-shirt or Fidel Castro. I mean, that's a murdering communist killing guy. It's against everything you think you stand for, Colin. Like, you're so clueless here. Let's help you out. But they, you wouldn't say that. But, you know, you, you could have solved it when it was one guy. Because here's what's happened. You're going to make this rule or you're going to do whatever. They're going to solve this problem. I predict they'll solve this problem. And then what's going to happen next year when someone's going to go, well, now I'm protesting. Um... Uh, I don't know, uh, nuclear weapons. I don't like the fact that any country in the world has nuclear weapons because you see all this nonsense when the rogue nations get them, and it scares me that it might somebody might use them one day again. I mean, we're the only country ever used them, by the way, so, gee, it's not like someone might use them. We did. Uh, so uh, I don't like that. So I'm going to protest against that. Well, we need to grab the guy immediately, preferably before he does it, because preferably you have a good enough relationship with employees where he comes into work with a you know, frown on his face, and you go, it's wrong. And hopefully he tells you, he goes, I'm just miserable. I'm scared out of my mind about all these nuclear weapons, and I wish there was something I can do about it. I think I'm going to do what that Kaepernick guy did years ago, and I'm going to kneel during the national anthem and start getting attention. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not have that. We'll lose fans. We'll lose sponsors. We'll lose money. We'll do whatever. You will become, you know, disliked by a huge percentage of our fan base. Like, hey, thanks for all those likes coming across, faces, whatever's going on. Brett O'Lai is here. And uh, Sean is here. Thanks for being here. So let's 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 nip this in the bud. Here's the deal. Whenever I go out to a restaurant with my beautiful wife Michelle, and there is some bad service or anyone else, uh, uh, I I don't I never blame the server, the waitress, the waiter. I always say, boy, uh, the manager here must suck, and therefore the owner must suck, because that's whose fault it is. There is something, either the hiring or the training or the managing of this person who is a front-facing employee. That means they interact directly with customers, clients, patients, members, whatever it is in your business. Like, your front-facing people can't act that way. Like, maybe, maybe, maybe a janitor can who no one ever sees. He only comes overnight. He can be disgruntled, although I'm going to tell you, like, you don't want that either if you don't want him not actually cleaning the toilets or not actually doing what I mean, you just, you don't want this. If you, if you have happy employees, that will in turn cause you to have happy clients, customers, patients, members. That's what Richard Branson's saying. That's what the NFL doesn't get. So this whole disgruntled player thing, they, like they say, they're doing it wrong and very clumsy, as I've always said, they, but they're, they're disrespecting the fans and their own flag and their own country, which are all ridiculous things to do. But they're acting out against the employers, treating them like crap. Because even though they make a lot of money, they are still treated like crap. I mean, they are told if you score a touchdown, you're not allowed to overly celebrate. Right? There's some rule. I don't know what it's called. Someone who's still an NFL fan might tell me what it's called. But excessive. I think it's called excessive celebration. What? Excessive celebration, you get a penalty. Okay. So you can celebrate. But don't really celebrate. Like, don't really be who you are. Don't really express yourself. Don't really, you're kidding me, right? These are multimillionaire entertainers. They entertain through playing a sport. And they score, and I would think that they're fairly happy. There's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, and it's not like basketball where they're scoring a basket every minute. These guys are scoring, like, three touchdowns a year. I think the average player, you know, offensive player, scores, like, one a year, five a year, three a year, whatever it is. I mean, uh, let's celebrate. Not to mention, since the team sport, what they're really celebrating is I did my job for the team. The quarterback threw me the ball. The guy's blocked. The other guy, you know, faked the run, whatever, and they threw me the ball, and I caught it. And therefore, everyone on my team gets to be happy and win. And, man, we're going to celebrate. But, oh, not too much because the employers say, oh, no, you don't. We're going to set unreasonably restrictive rules on how much you can celebrate or what you can wear, what you can say that. 
this, this, the players are, the employees, the NFL employees, the players are screaming out against being treated like second-class citizens by employers. I'm imploring you as a business owner, don't do that. Treat your employees, take care of your employees. Your clients do not come first, your employees come first. Take care of your employees, they'll take care of the clients. Whenever you check into a hotel and the person behind, the first, the, the guy comes running out to the bellhop to open the door and welcome you in, it's because he's being treated, he feels good working there. He's being treated well by the employer. You walk in, the person behind the desk, the counter smiles, can I help you? When they're really good, like the Four Seasons, they greet you by name. Yeah, they have facial recognition software. I don't know if you knew that. So when you're pulling up, you get out of that car, they see your face, computer instantly shows right in front of the person, this is the person's name, and they greet you by name as you walk in the door. Hey, Mr. Cypress, so glad you're here, and I see you're staying for four days. We're going to make the next four days spectacularly fantastic for you. Let me introduce you to this person, that person, anything you want. Don't even worry about your bags. They're probably already up in the room by the time you even got to the front. Desk. Everything is going to be taken here. We've already booked your dinners, your spa treatments, your this, your that, whatever, their blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the employees there are probably taken care of really well and are really happy to work with. The NFL employees, definitely not happy with a lot of the crap going on, and it's been historical. And like I said, I will share tomorrow, maybe not tell stories out of it, but I had some stories in there of abuse over the years through baseball. My senior on a thesis in college was about baseball and the reserve clause leading to the revolt of the players and the player strikes and the lockouts and all this kind of stuff because the players are not happy. You can pay them millions of dollars like we see in the NFL. Doesn't mean they're happy. Take care of your employees. They'll take care of the clients. NFL right now not taking care of their employees and therefore clients like me, a former client customer, gone forever, lost. Don't make that same mistake. I'll go to some questions, comments at the end here. Brett Elias says, give me a level two, an extreme level. <laughs> give me a level two, an extreme level two celebration. Right. Let, let me get it. If anybody's here or just think to yourself, you're watching the replay, which you know, 99% of the people watch these on the replay. Um, business owners are busy people. I, I, I expect that you're not here every time I shoot a live video. But I appreciate those that are. Um, uh, ask yourself. Do you like seeing no celebration, little celebration, a lot of celebration? I can tell you watching the baseball playoffs right now, every time a player flips his bat, every time Yasiel Puig licks a bat, sticks his tongue out, that camera's all over him. We love that. Who doesn't love that? My wife. I'll tell you, my beautiful wife, Michelle, is watching all this thing. That's disgusting. Why are people always sticking their tongue out in photos? All right. So my beautiful wife, Michelle, doesn't like Oh, he could get a, a sliver in his tongue from the... I'm pretty sure those bats are pretty smooth, like, you know, they're pretty, like, fine-made, like, but okay, she doesn't like it. and some people don't like the show boating. I happen to love it, Brett Olaya happens to love it, like, come on now, who doesn't, I, I love it, I told you, my fa I just, I, I expressed it, my favorite part of the game last night, Kyle Schwaber hits a home run in the first inning, and you can't see the dugout, because they're playing in decrepit, miserable Wrigley Field, where the player, the, the fans don't get to actually see what's going on, but Somewhere in the bowels of the decrepit old stadium, they've now decided to make a closet into the bullpen. And uh, the players are dancing and parting their brains out. I think the Cubs are the team. Are the Cubs the team? Somebody let me know if you know that when they go on road trips, they often have, like, fa funny dress for the road trip day. Like, they dress in costumes. Like, one's a clown and one's a this and one's a that. And they have so much fun. And, like, I think that's the Cubbies. Like, this is fun. I love that stuff. Like, what do you mean you're wearing the, the suits? And why we know that. What are you, you're sitting in the bullpen and you just go like that. No, they're dancing, they're laughing. They're di I want to see the celebrations. I want to see Terrell Owens take out a Sharpie and sign the goalpost. I want to I want to see Billy White shoes. When I was a kid, Billy White shoes Johnson. Like the, one of the first one, the first one I remember to do a ridiculous, crazy celebration in the end zone. Like, we love that. Billy, we I was rude for Billy White shoes Johnson. I'm I'm I think at the time, he's, who was he playing on? Atlanta, Houston, whatever. I was not a fan of them, but I love, I wanted him to catch touchdowns, and I knew on Monday Night Football, Howard Cosell is going to play the halftime highlights, and I wanted to see Billy White shoot Johnson do the splits and Icky Woods do the Icky Shuffle, and I'm like, who doesn't want to see this stuff? But the NFL's like, oh, no, no, 
no, nope, not allowed. If I, hey, I'll tell you what. One thing, my beloved white Michelle is still uh, a uh, a fan of the Packers. She so she last couple of weeks has gone off to her sisters or parents to watch the game. She's like, you know, I got to go. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm like, yeah, right. Because and, and one week I went with her. I just sat outside doing some reading and catching up on stuff. And then I was like, but then you know, people came right for the game. They left right after. I'm like, I'm not going to go there again. I thought after people going to hang out, but no, they take off. So. Why do I go sit out in 97 degree weather here in the Phoenix area uh, to do some reading while people are in there watching a bunch of, you know, ridiculous team owners, you know, disrespecting their players. So the players disrespect the fans not watching it. Uh, But I digress. Uh, They're still Packer fans. And the Packers, I think, are the only team where there is this excessive celebration is loud. There's Lambeau Leap, unless something's changed in the last four weeks since I've ceased to be a fan of the league. I think they're still able to only in Packerland in in Green Bay when they catch a touchdown or they run when they score a touchdown the players allowed to then run through the end zone and leap the six foot or whatever it is retaining wall and and leap into the stands and everyone you know grabs them and loves them and is so happy the player is in their lap I mean how great come on how great is that so I mean uh, I know when I was watching earlier this year I watched like two or three games maybe maybe two and uh, their star receiver Jordy Nelson Refused to do Lambo Leap. I know he missed last year or the year before with an injury, so maybe he's afraid of pulling something or an injury or whatever. But, like, he scores the most touchdowns on the team, and he wasn't doing the Lambo Leap, and I'm all disappointed. I'm like, where's the Lambo Leap? I want to see the Lambo Leap. I want to see that. I want to see individualism. I want to see crazy celebrations. I grew up, you know, my my favorite, uh, not my favorite, but, you know, top star player in the New York Jets. My favorite player was Emerson Boozer. Uh, not actually the star of the team, but one of their running backs. Um, but uh, Joe Namath was the star of the Jets when I was a kid. He signed when I was five years old, and certainly, you know, through my whole childhood, there he was. And he was, you know, renegade with the crazy facial hair and wearing the nylons and wearing the, the, the mink coats and wearing the white shoes during the games. Well, you don't wear white shoes in the NFL back in those days. Well, we love that stuff. Like individuality, the NFL is all about, just like the Army, you know, or, there, or any service, uh, military, like, oh, no, there's no individuals here, blah, blah, blah. How's that working out for you, NFL? Okay, so, yeah, we'd love to see much more craziness individuals. Love to see Yasiel Puig. I mean, come on now, the guy flies out, he flips the bat. Guy hits a double, he's flipping the bat, showboating, whatever, like, we love that stuff. So, uh, NFL, take care of your employees, dude. Take care of your employees. I think they're doing that now. They keep meeting with them. Oh, we're going to start an initiative. We're going to do whatever. And yeah, we'll get it done. And get it done quick. And then guess what? You won't have to make a rule that they have to whatever. They will want to salute the flag like all the fans, 90 whatever percent in the stands are doing. They Because you notice the people protesting outside the stadium are all kneeling or whatever or on social media like, yeah, well, I'm a fan. How many season tickets did you buy in your lifetime? How many direct TV NFL Sunday tickets did you buy? How many games have you been to? You're not a fan. The, the, play, the people that are not a fan are all in favor of all the kneeling and protesting and whatever. The fans are not. But I predict, and I guess we'll check back over time, but mark my words, that when the NFL takes care of the players and the players are happy, they will no longer disrespect their own fans, their own selves, for crying out loud, their own country, their own flag, their own national anthem. That's how it works. Take care of your employees. They'll take care of the fans, no matter what business you have. That's how it works. Agree? Disagree? Let me know. I'm okay with anything you want to agree or disagree. At the end here, let's go. I got one more comment. Take care of the employees. They'll take care of the customer. Steve Cypress. Uh, Brett Olaya, I know you came on in the middle, and I appreciate you giving me the credit. But uh, even if you read the title of this, I put it right up there in the title, okay? It's billionaire entrepreneur Richard Branson who has that sage advice for all business owners. Richard Branson's quote is, Clients do not come first. Employees come first. Take care of your employees. They will take care of your clients. That's a quote from Richard Branson, although thank you, Brett Elias, for giving me the credit. And we'll leave it there for Wisdom Wednesday. There's a bit of wisdom from Steve Cypress. I said that. I made it up. I am a multi-billionaire serial entrepreneur and world record holder and bon vivant and that's me and uh i just uh, don't have quite as much hair as richard branson or anything else for that matter and so 
Brett Elia has one more comment, and then we'll go. I was at the Cubs game in L.A. on Sunday. How cool is that? Yeah, Brett Elia, who's from Chicago his whole life, now lives in L.A., went to the game. Oh, and I love it. So you can tell he's a Cub fan. He calls it the Cubs game. He was at the Cubs game in Los Angeles. I mean, pretty sure even the Cubs wouldn't call that a Cubs game. Like, But anyway, I could have sworn the announcer pronounced Yasiel Puig's name Yuck Yuck Pui. Okay, maybe he did. I don't know. And maybe that's an inside joke and whatever. Okay, I don't get it. I uh, wasn't there. Didn't hear it. But uh, right, why not? Like, we love an out. That's a great point. We'll end with that, I guess, unless we never end. I just keep getting off on a tangent and a rant. But we love the announcers who are individuals. And they announce the players with their nicknames and their whatever. And, like, because uh, uh, Michael Buffer made that famous in uh, in the ring with his uh, let's get – I can't say it because I'll have to owe him royalties. But let's get ready to, you know – have a boxing match. And so that was a unique, uh, exciting introduction that he gave to players. And we love the announcers that say, you know, you know, uh, Bob Shepard, New York Yankees, uh, was famous for, you know, being the most deadpan, boring, you know, guy. So if that's what you like, that was him. Number two, Derek Jita. Number two. Like, dude, come on now. Can't you go like, Oh, uh, who was it? Oh, it was, uh, I forget the guy's name, Philadelphia. Who remembers the Philadelphia 76ers PA announcer uh, 30, 40 years ago? I mean, that guy was the best. i got to look it up now. That guy was awesome. Uh, it's uh, Hal Greer. Love that. You could have just said Hal Greer, or whatever his name is, and everybody else. I mean, that guy, he was the best. Uh, Philly PA announcer for the Philadelphia 76ers. We love that kind of stuff, NFL. Get a clue and stop with the trying to control your players. Your, have a little respect for your players. Your players are multimillionaires. They are celebrities. They are beloved by millions of people everywhere they go who just wish they could, like, touch them, have them sign an autograph, have them say hello, have them take a picture. Like, we, they, you know, they will, people will buy anything these guys say they use, or even if they don't, like, you know, they are beloved people. And yet you make all these arbitrary and restrictive rules of adult entertain. They're entertainers. Could you imagine if there was an NFL of rock and roll and somehow there was a league and Mick Jagger would go dancing on stage and someone would come down and go excessive dancing on the stage, Mick. You're off for the next set. Like, you're not allowed to do that. Like, what are you talking about? Like, Gene, Sim Gene Simmons, yep, excessive makeup. You can't stick your tongue out there, Gene. It's too long. Uh, you can't uh, wear ridiculous makeup and, and those ridiculous boots. And, uh, that's too ridiculous. Uh, rock and roll. Oh, and your hair's too long, rock and roll. It's way too long. Like, and, and Angus, you know, ACDC, Angus Young, you are just – Put your hair is just going too crazy up and down. Like you can't do that, and you certainly can't wear those schoolboy shorts. They're they're too much above the knee. There's a restriction there. Like what are we in Catholic school? Like cut it out, NFL. Res lift all the restrictions. Treat your people like human beings, and watch what happens. Watch what happens. Do anything close to it. It's not Donald Trump's idea. Oh, one more rule that ought to do it. There's enough rules. Donald Trump, of all, of all people, who has fantastically, awesomely, for the good of our country and the economy, released and, and negated more regulations than any president in the history of mankind. What a fantastic thing. So is he doing that because he, I don't know, is he doing it in some micro way that he knows that's good for the economy? Is he doing it just to spite Barack Obama, which would also be good because I don't know just about anything that guy did that helped the country. Uh, it's certainly not the economy, uh, but uh, it's not a general principle of his. It's certainly not general principle of Trump to have less rules. Trump's an authoritarian. Trump believes I will fix things. I will make the laws to fix things. Uh, no, dude, get out of the way. Like get government out of the way, get the NFL out of the way, get the U.S. government out of the way, lift all the restrictions, and let's get to go. How about if people showed up at a game next Sunday and said, I wonder what's going to happen if so and so scores a touchdown. I have no idea what he's going to do. I can't wait. That anticipation. Hey, whatever your name is. I was going to say Pete Rosell. Then I was going to say Paul Tagliabue. Whatever this guy's name is. What's his name? Roger Goodell. Hey, Roger. Like, how cool would that be for the fans to go like, I can't wait to see what these guys are going to do. And they don't mean disrespecting the flag. They mean celebrating a sack. Oh, you can't celebrate a sack. You can't do like this. That's taunting. That's excessive celebration. Excuse me? 
The guy just did a sack like the lead leader does one a game on the average. These guys, they're, come on now. These guys, first of all, they overeat and overwork out their whole life on their spindly little normal human ankles, slightly more than normal because they're 6'5", but they put 350 pounds on them. I mean, five years after they play, they can't even walk. They need hip surgeries, whatever. So they're dedicating the whole life to this thing to get bigger and bigger and bigger because the guy on the other side of the ball is getting bigger and bigger, and they got to block him. And, and so you're a defender, and you're rushing in there, and every play you are creaming into a 350-pound lineman who's stopping you every single play, just frustrating, 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 frustrating. And once or twice or three times a year or eight times a year if you're a superstar, and if you're a Hall of Famer, it's – 12 times a year, 10 times a year, you sack the quarterback. You do your, you, you do the most amazing thing you can do and sack the quarterback. And what? You you can't celebrate? You can't do this kind of stuff or put the hands on the board. We'll do whatever. Who knows? We'll just look at him and go like, well, hey, player did that in baseball last night, right? There you go. Baseball doesn't have a rule against his excel, excessive celebrating. And if they're smart, they never will. Let we flip the bat all over the place. Schwarberg flipped his bat. He flipped it in disdain as if like he popped out. He was like, oh, whatever home run. Uh, but how about the second baseman? Javier Baez, the greatest tagging guy in all of baseball ever that I've seen. Roberto Alomar was awesome with this. Javier Baez, man, don't be running anywhere near him because he'll tag out no matter where the throw is. And he, he and it was point. He tags. That was a double, double uh, fan enjoyment. Uh, Puig trying to stretch that uh, single into a double. Javier Baez slaps the, or was a strikeout, throw him out, double play, tried to steal, whatever it was. Slaps the tag on him, and uh, he's, and, and Baez just looks at him and goes, no, 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 no. Get that crap out of here. Don't even try it on me, my friend. And if you see a photo of it or see a replay of it, you'll see that Puig is smiling from ear to ear. My beautiful Aunt Michelle is like, why is he smiling? He was out. I'm like, because he recognizes a great play, and he's having fun. He hits a homer. He's having fun. He strikes out. He's having fun. He gets thrown out. He's having fun. Not going to stop him from having fun. The fans love it. He's having fun. I got to take another drink of water, which is a signal I've been on way too long. And so, boy, that water's kind of warm with the 97-degree sun just beating down on it. And I'll be doing a couple of these Facebook Live videos, by the way, on my brand new iPad now that my old iPad 3 couldn't do it. The software wouldn't work. But now, and uh, I'll do these uh, in the coming uh, a uh, few days or so. Probably I'll be out on my terrace here, and you'll see the spectacular view I get to see, and I'll do them from out by my pool or a couple of events I'll be attending, and we'll do all kinds of fun ones because fun. What's wrong with fun? Actually, bad question. question is how much more fun can you put into your business? And, yeah, I'm talking to you, NFL. How much more fun can you put in your business? How much better can you treat your employees? I'm talking to you, Goodell, you, Jerry Jones, you, every team owner in the NFL, every coach in the NFL, and you watching every entrepreneur and every business owner. What if you woke up every day and you said, how can I make today a better experience for my employees? What can I do to surprise them with something great and positive? Man, watch what happens when you do that. Watch what happens to the customer, client, patient, member experience when the owner of the business is focusing every day on how can I make this a better place to work, more enjoyable, more fun, better for my employees. And again, as the NFL players prove, it's not just about the money. They're paying them millions. So Mr. Business Owner, whoever's watching this, I'm pretty sure that's more than you pay your employees. So don't think there's any amount you can pay your employees that they will therefore overlook everything else and say, therefore, I'm happy. Okay, Not going to happen. As Branson says, clients don't come first. Employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they'll take care of the clients. That's it for Wisdom Wednesday today. John Bachman is here. I know John Bachman takes care of his employees. Been to his place many times as a reason why he's been voted for, I don't know, seven years in a row. The number one auto repair facility in the entire county. Uh, seven years in a row, maybe eight now. Like, extraordinary. Not only does John take care of his clients, but you think John's there all the time? John's almost never there. He takes care of his employees. His employees take care of the clients. That's how it works, folks. If John Bachman is running the NFL or just an NFL team, and, you know, uh, Papa Hallis, George Hallis, used to hang out in the gas station that John's father owned before John took it over because the Packers used to train right out there uh, in the town where John or near the town where that gas station was. So 
There it is, fitting, NFL and John Bachman. And uh, up, John says, ah, Dave Zinkoff, that was it. Thank you, John Bachman. Dave Zinkoff, Philadelphia 76ers announcer. Man, we love that kind of stuff. Don't give me the old uh, number 42, Billy Cunningham, number 24, whatever number he was, 32, Billy Cunningham, I remember. Uh, you know, number six, Julius Irving. Uh, Julius Irving. Love that stuff. Okay, and Brett Elias says rock and roll dress codes, haha. Right, but that's the NFL, and not only just dress codes, but how about uh, uh, um, uh, action codes? Um, uh, I forget the the term for it, but uh, codes of conduct, code of conduct, like a rock and roll code of conduct, is absurd. So how can you have one in the NFL? That's just pure stupidity. Come on, cut it out. All right, and Harry Carey, another good one. Not not a PA announcer. So not exactly what I meant. I meant, uh, you know, because Harry, oh, Harry Carey's singing that seventh inning, take me out to the ball game where he's already in a drunken stupor from having 42 Budweiser's through the first six innings. That's fun. What if you said, I'm going to make a rule, Harry, you can't drink Buds on the air? No, 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 no. That would have ruined the whole thing. Or Harry Carey, you can't make any ridiculous Homer comments. And Homer, I don't mean home run. I mean, like anything that happened was only seen through the rosy, 17-inch thick glasses of Harry Carey that, you know, oh, if it was a call against the Cubs, it must have been a bad call. If, uh, any, if, you know, anything happened, you know, all seen through the eyes of the Cubs. Yeah, we love that stuff. I know the school of broadcasting because I went to school and I ran my college radio station and I worked in radio station. That was going to be my career, um, and it was for a while, is the idea, oh, you've got to be objective. And you got, you know, we don't root for the home team. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Home and out. Harry Carey, home announcers root for the home team. Okay. And the home, Dave Zinkoff and the home PA announcers, they root for the home team and they make it an experience, an exciting thing. So NFL, take that lesson. And uh, Brett says, loved Harry. Who didn't? And that's it for Wisdom Wednesday. It's been a long one, folks. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all those likes, comments. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching you guys watching on the replay on YouTube, Twitter. All my Facebook pages, my email, Rhino Daily Podcast, Rhino Daily Blog, wherever you're reading or watching this or whatever, thank you. Uh, LinkedIn, another one, and wherever else. It's all over the place. Uh, thanks for being here today, and I'll be back tomorrow with Throwback Thursday. I hate to, like, go away in the middle of all these likes coming across, but I've learned my lesson in the past. Like, they're never going to stop, are they? So thank you, Brett Lion, whoever else is doing all those. I'm going to shut it off now because I am. Just gonna shut it off. But again, see, there's no rules. Like, hey, too many likes. Red Alaya, I'm 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 oh, I can unfriend I'm unfriending you. I'm banning you from my video. It's too many excessive celebration. Excessive celebration, Red Alaya. Too many likes across the screen. We can't have that here on the Steve Cypress video. Steve Cypress video is 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 serious. And the Steve Cypress video will not stand for this excessive. You can celebrate, you can put one like. But this excessive celebration, that's unbecoming. That that damages the brand. We're all, you know, blah, blah. I don't even know what the NFL's reason is for restricting the play. I think because they want to make it all about the NFL and they want to subjugate the players. Again, not the plantation. That's going a lot too far. But, uh, yeah, players are mistreated. Always have been. Historically, players have been mistreated by the millionaire and now billionaire owners, even though the players are now millionaires themselves. And, of course, without them, there is no product and they have leverage. And now they're making it known. Hey, dude, we got leverage. Make us happy. Okay, then we'll believe me. We'll salute the flag. We'll do all the things you want. Make us happy. Lesson, hopefully, you'll learn from them for your business. Over and out. Back tomorrow on Throwback Thursday. Thanks for being here today.